the rules of engagement. Somewhere here are the rules of engagement. This is an interview, not a debate. So there will be no redirect questions or follow-up questions. Candidates are allowed a one and a half minute initial introductory statement. Our panelists would each have up to 30 seconds to pose their question. Uh, if the second candidate does show up, they have an option of directing their question to one of the candidates or they can convert their question into a yes-no form and direct it to both of the candidates. Candidates will have one minute to respond. Um, this is not a, a forum for the airing of personal grievances and complex questions that require too lengthy an answer will be disqualified. And so, uh, with that, Mr. Mackin, if you'll give us a 90 second introductory statement, please. Well, uh, I have to have you have to get right up on the microphone, we apologize. That's okay, I do have a question for you. I have a handout here with my resume. Uh, may I distribute this among the panel sure. members? Yep. Does this count against his minute and a half? My timekeeper's got a fixed clock. You know the camera's rolling. Thank you. Well, it's okay. It's all part of the game. It's in close up mode. Actually, she's up here. Yeah. Here, say some paper. I like your oh, side. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Okay, now please proceed with your uh, 90 second introductory statement, sir. Thank you. Uh, as you can see by my resume, uh, I am a, I'm an Army veteran from Vietnam. I am also a family man. I have a wife, I have a uh, daughter who lives in Ohio, and grandchildren who live there. Uh, I am an attorney by profession, not licensed in Nevada, but I was licensed in New York State and still am. I practiced law there for 32 years, dealing as a, essentially a solo uh, practitioner, one attorney, one secretary office. We handled pretty much anything that came through the door. Most of my practice involved real estate transactions, uh, municipal law, and you can see that I've held municipal offices before. Uh, and uh, I finished my uh, legal career in New York State, retiring in December 2007. I spent the last six years, six and a half years actually, as attorney in the social services department. In that capacity, Unlike here, where the district attorney's office handles child abuse and child neglect cases, uh, they fell to the social services department to handle those types of matters. We handled them uh, not as criminal matters, we handled them as family court matters, uh, putting the emphasis upon uh, protecting the children as opposed to trying to punish parents uh, for behaviors that they have had. All right. That beep does indeed signify the end of your time. That's what I thought when I saw it beep from Mr. Blacks. Our uh, first uh, question will be posed by Tom Blanchard, who is a Navy veteran and president of Veterans Real Estate. Good afternoon. Um, let me just ask you uh, one qu quick question on the uh, margins tax. Um, one, if you're for it against it. And two, if you do. Um, Get elected and are up the legislature, and the margin tax does, which is question three, does fail. Would you still feel pressured, or would you want to sponsor a bill that would um, increase some kind of funding for the school? Let me answer this this way I feel that it is not appropriate for people who have been in the legislature or for candidates for the legislature to be telling people how to vote on the margins tax. And I'm not going to do that. I think everybody can decide what they think about it, whether they like it, whether they dislike it. And I think that the, uh, the legislature shouldn't have kicked the can down the road, but when they did, I think they have a responsibility 
to accept what the people vote on. And if the people voted in, it, then it needs to have rough edges taken off of it. I certainly, with my background, uh, I will be able to work on taking the rough edges off. If the people don't vote it in, well then, life has to go on uh, because the people of the state have set the parameters. And I think that's their job to do, not mine at this point in time. Our second question will be posed by uh, Mike Angel, who's the founder of Nevada Legal Forums and Tax Services. Mike? If elected, what's the one issue that you want to to change Carson City or bring to the table Carson City? I think it's very difficult just to point to just one issue. There are all kinds of things that are going on in government. The, uh, the relationship of government to the economy is always of importance. The uh, decisions that are made in Carson City as to what the parameters are going to be on funding of various agencies including schools and everybody else, there, those are always issues. And to say, well, I'm going to go up there, it's all going to be about this or that. It, it's not going to be, and I know it's not going to be. It's going to be on the things that come up. Obviously, the budget is going to be a very, very important part of it. Uh, I believe that the system here calls for the governor to present his budget. It doesn't call for 63 people in the legislature to go creating budgets. They need to work off what gets presented to them. Sometimes one will think that things are overfunded. There are other times that you think they're underfunded. And it's a matter of working things out and compromising. And that'll be part of it. Our next panelist to close the question will be uh, Amber Guyman, who is a paralegal by uh, profession, military spouse, and parent. Um, what are your thoughts on a state lottery? And if you would support a state lottery, how would you delegate the funds or what would you recommend the funds go towards? Okay. I am not a great fan of, uh, let's call it the kind of tax system that we have here in the state. I like to call it a boutique tax system. It reaches this, it reaches that, it reaches this, it reaches that, it doesn't touch this, it doesn't touch that. And unfortunately, I think we tend to react to that with the idea that we need a specialized tax for schools, or we need a specialized tax for police, or we need a specialized tax for this, that, or the other thing. The problem with that type of system and that type of thinking is that there are many, many worthy causes. And I think that this is unfortunate when the very first worthy cause gets a great hearing. But by the time we reach the third one, nobody wants to hear about it at all. And I think that's what legislatures are all about. Now, to get back to the lottery issue, I understand that the gaming industry is not in favor of having a lottery. I think it's too bad. I think it could be part of the overall picture, but it isn't. And I think that uh, we have to live with that. And until it gets changed, either by the legislature deciding to change it, and I think that that's not likely to happen, unless the gaming industry has a large voice on what goes on with it, or it's changed by both of the people, then lottery can be looked at. But I don't think it should be just for a specialized purpose. Our next panelist is uh, Melissa Broadway, a political consultant. Hi, thank you for being here. My question is about education, um, specifically about parents' responsibility in education. <clears throat> We've talked a lot today about funding for education and appropriation of funds. Um, would you support legislation that actually specifically goes after parents who are allowing their children to become truants and or dropping out? Um, would it be something that you would consider? I, I'm not sure what you're driving at with, with the question. I, I don't think we fund education by paying parents. We, we fund education by putting it into the schools. And we expect that there will be attendance at, at school. Correct. My, my question was more about um, parental responsibility with when it comes to attendance. Because right now, there are a lot of students that are dropping out early. There's, there's a huge dropout rate, and there's a lot of kids that just aren't going to schools. Do you feel like there should be legisl tougher legislation on parents who are not making sure that their children attend schools on a regular basis? I, I, think, that's, <clears throat> I think that's a very difficult question to, uh, to assess blame to a parent. I have a daughter. Fortunately, things went well with us. But I know people who have children who are very rebellious, 
who don't want to do what their parents tell them. And I think that if you try to base a system on punishing parents because there is a really errant child, it's really putting emphasis in the wrong place. I do think that in education, it's important to uh, try to give every child that comes to that school a good background, a good background of what constitutes America, and, uh, and get them started in life. But, but let's also re realize that not every child is terribly receptive to these things. And it's going to be an ongoing process going on forever between teacher and student and parent. Our next panelist is Jay Girardi, who's a um, Marine veteran. How you doing, Joe? Good. Gerald, actually, that's, that's the root name of my name, Gerald. Yes, I see that. <laughs> um, you know, in the time and age we're living in in the United States, um, we're seeing more and more where the judicial side of the branch is becoming more and more powerful versus the other the two branches. Um, back in the uh, early days of our forefathers, uh, in particular uh, Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, when a federal judge passed a law, there was times and instances where they said, thank you for your opinion and continue to move on. Um, if we have situations where federal judge throws our legislators uh, voting out, it says on Constitution, for example, would you be willing to consider something like our forefathers have done? What do you have in mind? I, I'm not sure that, that your view of what our forefathers did or didn't do uh, coincides with my view of what they did or didn't do is. But. Say if, um, you, as, as a, uh, if you become um, elected, and you as a legislator, along with the legislators, pass a law, a bill, and it's challenged, and a judge, federal judge, for example, rules it unconstitutional. Would you leave it at that, or would you uh, challenge that, or, or look to move, even ignore that federal judge following on constitution? I, I don't think that you can or should just ignore other branches of government. I think this is why we have checks and balances. And, and let's be realistic, uh, none of us are are omnipotent and uh, uh, omniscient. We don't know everything. We're going to put things together. Sometimes legislation is concocted that, that looks pretty good on its face, but once it gets into te the test of, of a real case applied to it, maybe it isn't so smart after all. And I do think that the role of, among the branches of government is a checks and balances role. And just because a federal judge tells me that I'm wrong about something doesn't mean that I should get my back up and say, well, I'm going to ignore you. And, and frankly, I think in our early days, uh, if I remember my history lessons correctly, and I may or may not, uh, John Marshall was a very powerful uh, uh, judicial voice. And he didn't agree with Thomas Jefferson and some of the others. All right, uh, our next uh, question comes from Rowena Christensen, who's the founder of the Shine Family Foundation, except that she was called away. <laughs> and, and as the odds would have it, she's the one sitting right next to the bright lights that are shining on the As I can see, she has one. So we're going to call next on um, Dr. Danielle Dubright, who is a host of what do you see as being Nevada's greatest challenge, and how will you address it? I think we have a number of challenges. I, I think we have a couple of them that are sleepers, and I think they're very important to keep in mind. Uh, one of them is it, it's financial, and I think that in our state we're going to be looking around for sources of revenue. Uh, I think it's just it, it's important for you to know what I won't do not just what I'm willing to do. And that is that <clears throat> one of the things that's been floating around out there is this whole idea of bringing nuclear waste into Yucca Mountain. And I realize that there are states in this country that are willing to pay, pay some money in order to go ahead and do it. But I think that in this great state, the resort industry, 
The retirement home sector is so important that we have to make a value judgment to stay away from that. And I think that it, it's sort of like uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden being presented with that tantalizing apple. This is one we should leave alone. Our next uh, question comes from Michael Measure, who is an attorney here in Las Vegas. Good afternoon, Joe. Uh, you uh, testified earlier, or actually spoke earlier, <clears throat> about some rough edges on the margins tax if it uh, did get passed, and you worked to remove those rough edges. Can you share with us what you see as the rough edges to the margin tax? I, I think with any of these types of taxes, I think you can see from, from my educational background in taxation, uh, the devil is not necessarily in the legislation. It comes in the regulations that get adopted to, to try to carry it out. And that's the part where I would be concerned with uh, margins tax. How you define the things that are deducted from the, the totals uh, compared to things that aren't. And uh, I think it, it's premature at this point to be talking about what they are and they aren't. I mean, we don't even have the, the, the measure passed by the voters. But if it is, those issues are all going to come right to the surface. And just as they are, uh, let's be real, in the mining tax and its application, there are all kinds of issues as to what qualifies and what doesn't qualify as an appropriate deduction before the tax is applied. The same thing will happen with the margins tax if it's passed. If it's not, then we don't have, we don't have an issue on it. But if it is, those will be the rough edges, and there'll be lots of them, I'm sure. Next panelist uh, to pose a question will be Dr. Jasmine Brooks, as well as being a medical doctor. She is another Las Vegas attorney. Thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you. This, this question is just to piggyback on one of the issues that we had uh, with our last panel regarding medical marijuana. If, what, if you were elected, what kind of legislation would you pass or what would your approach be, whether to support or in opposition? Uh, what kind of legislation would you pass that are, are you talking about legislation that would uh, deal with the issue of medical marijuana as opposed to recreational use of it? Correct, medical marijuana and you know the conflicting issues that we have as far as state law and federal law. The conflicting issues of state and federal law are going to be there whether I'm elected or I'm not elected because the federal government has to decide what it's willing to do and what it's not willing to do. And I realize that if we adopt something here in this state and it, and it it's fine among our residents, but the federal government thinks otherwise, there's going to be this conflict. I don't think. I don't think that it's for us to try to second guess the federal government. I think we need to just go ahead and adopt what we're going to adopt. That having been said, I grew up in a doctor's household. As such, I've never been a fan of drug use. And I'm not a fan of it now. But I do recognize that this particular use from science and other things that have occurred from it has some merits. And I think that anybody sitting in the legislature needs to set aside their own opinion about drug use and take a good look at the merits of all this and try to adjust it accordingly. Will there still be a conflict with federal law? Probably, until such time as those in Congress change it. Okay, our next panelist is Brian Bouchant. He is a Army veteran and the president of Fallen Not Forgotten. How are you doing? Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank My you. question is, what do you think about the idea of increasing the taxes on the wealthy to compensate for the ones that don't make as much? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that it's to compensate for those who don't make as much. You want a fair system. And let's be real. I, I, America's been very good to me. I, I've prospered well. My family's prospered well over the years. I don't begrudge it. And I think that it's very important that we have a system that's fair from top to bottom. But we also have to recognize that sometimes there are people who just don't have the earning capacity that others do. We need a system that takes all those things into consideration and doesn't get outrageous in either direction. But is it a compensation? No, it's not a compensation. It's a balancing, really. And I think that it, it's part of, of what any uh, good system is going to have will have some balancing on this. I don't know whether that addresses what you have in mind. 
Our next panelist is John Shoot Jr. John, when he's not participating in veterans and politics, is a metropolitan police officer. Hey, John, I just have a question uh, regarding uh, the bill that's going to come from the legislature allowing uh, professors and students at the universities to carry their firearm as long as they have a CCW in their training. Would you be in support of that or against that? I, I'm not happy with the idea of uh, firearms being carried by teachers. My wife's a school teacher. I sure as heck don't want to put a firearm in her hands. Uh, I, I think that teachers should be teachers and that's what they should be doing. If security is needed, doggone it, let's pay for it and put, the, put people in there who know what they're doing and who can concentrate on providing the security and let teachers do the job they're supposed to do, which is trying to get the instructional material across. I don't think it's a wise idea to try to combine the two. What about the, the students? This, this means students carrying firearms. <clears throat> I think back to college days, I can think of some drunken parties going on. Uh, the idea of students running around with firearms with those types of circumstances, I got a problem with that. I'd much rather fund appropriate security to provide real security and not just expect that everybody's going to be their own security. Okay, Stillman? I'll pass it. All right, I think that brings to a close then. The, oh, we have an audience question. Thank you. Hey, Ed. The microphone's right over there, Ed. Yeah, um, it looks like the school district's going to have more kids and they have spaces in the schools coming uh, this coming semester. Would you support uh, school vouchers instead of constructing these uh, little uh, jail training centers? <laughs> when, when you say school vouchers, are how, how broad are you defining that usage? Very broad. That the parents and the, ch uh, the children decide how they use them and where they use them. Maybe the school could serve as a testing center, uh, but uh, that they could even send their kid to a foreign country. I, I think that public schools should be funded as public schools. I'm a product of a public school system. I'm also a product of a private school system. My parents chose to send me off to private high school. They paid the bill. They did go down to the tax collector and ask to be relieved to pay for the public system. I think we have a public system. It needs to be open to everybody. And I'm very concerned with the idea that vouchers get spread into a way to fund private schools for special people. And I think that is, is a serious problem. It, and it goes very much against the grain of America to think that uh, we'll divert money. I'm not in favor of doing that. Okay, that appears to be it for now, so thank you very much for coming down. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.